we bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father, again, we come in the precious name of Jesus, asking for a new anointing from heaven and for divine illumination upon the word. Speak to our hearts once again, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I want us to turn to the book of 2 Kings, the second chapter, and begin reading with the 23rd verse. 2 Kings chapter 2, starting with verse 23. Now here's the story of Elisha going up to Bethel. And I've preached on this before, but I trust that we'll get something new out of it this morning. And he, that is Elisha, went up from thence, that is, he's going up from Jericho unto Bethel. And as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children out of the city and mocked him, and said unto him, Go up, thou bald head, go up, thou bald head. And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood and tear forty and two children of them. Uh, he says he went from thence to Mount Carmel in Samaria. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. I suppose if there's any story in the Bible that's disturbing to people, it's this one. To think that a prophet of God would curse children and that God should allow two bears to come out and tear them or maul them. And the New International Version says maul them. And to think that God would permit it. Now, I want you to see something. If there's anything that takes the temperature of human nature, this one will. Uh, can you imagine a prophet of God doing And imagine God doing You see, what? I want you to see something. What our nature does immediately is jump to the protection of children and we don't ask God and God why in the world did this happen. You see, God never does anything wrong. So if he doesn't do anything wrong, then he has a reason for what he did. And our hearts ought to humble before God and say, God, why did you do this? What's the matter with us? Instead of what's the matter with us, it's God, what's the matter with you? I want you to see human nature here. Because thus this appears to be terrible. Now, if it'll help any, the new, these weren't little children. I think the New International Version says young people. The translation would be young people. And if it'll help any, he didn't, the bears didn't kill anybody. Now, that may not be much consolation, but he didn't kill anybody. And it says he mauled them, 42 of them. Now, how many there were there, we don't know. There could have been more, many more there. But at least the bears mauled 42 of them. Now, I want, to know, I want you to know one thing. I have a feeling that by the time these young people got home, that uh, there was quite a stir in that city. And I have an idea that they had a message to bring to their parents. Ah. Uh, now, I want you, first of all, to see the prophet is coming from Jericho, a city that was cursed. That's the first city, you know, that Israel entered into. The walls fell down and Joshua cursed the city. Anybody rebuilt it? And when it was rebuilt, this, the cursed city was cursed. And uh, so here Elisha, the prophet of God, comes to them and they ask him if they couldn't help remove. The water was bitter. They, it, and people got sick drinking it. They couldn't raise good crops. And Elisha healed the waters, and that city became a wonderful city to live. The city had been cursed, and he was coming from that city that had been cursed here to Bethel, which is the city of God. He was coming from this one to the city of God. Uh, Bethel, I think, means house of God. And he's going up to Bethel, and Bethel had a great heritage. It was one of those, those uh, great cities in Israel. And uh, something happened uh, that caused what in the world happened that the young people of that city 
could mock a prophet of God and mock God and mock Elijah. Something must have happened in that city. These young people wouldn't have that turned out that way if something, if they, they were coming out of their environment, out of the city, something must have happened in this city. And uh, Bethel is the place where God met to Jacob. It's the, uh, uh, God called it. He said to Jacob when he was down at Laban's house, he said, come back to Bethel. God said, come back. This is the place where God meets. This is where God is, the house of God. This is the wonderful place. This is the heritage of Israel, is Bethel. And this is where uh, Elisha is going up there and something must have happened in that city. Something had to happen for these young people to go down there and uh, I want you to see something. He had come down where he'd worked this marvelous miracle in Jericho. And these young people were mocking not only Elisha, but they were mocking Elijah who had gone up to heaven in a whirlwind. That's why they said to him, go up thou bald head, go up. So they were mocking Elijah and all the wonderful miracles that God did through this. They were mocking them. Now I want you to see these young people are, are simply displaying what had happened up in the city of Bethel, this great city of God. Something happened in that city. And that's the thing I want us to look at uh, this morning. And I marvel that all of the great things that God did through Elijah, that they would mock him. Why would they mock such a man? Now, you'd think if there's anybody in Israel they would never have mocked and had any respect for, they'd have had respect for Elijah and Elisha. And uh, so with all of the, the miracles that Elijah did, I want you to know that it did not impress the people of Bethel. They were not impressed. Now God does miracles for his children. I want you to see something. I, I'm thankful every time God does a miracle. And I want you to know that God works miracles with his people. He did through Elijah. He did it for the children of Israel. He did it and when we should, and I'm encouraged to see the wonderful way God seems to be healing in our midst. But I want you to know something, that miracles will not cause us to be spiritual. So these people in Bethel were not the least bit impressed with the miracles. They weren't the least bit impressed. So miracles alone will not bring people to God. They will not cause people to follow God. They'll cause, they'll, they'll bring a crowd. And uh, I want you to know as we look at this, that as I said, God works marvelous miracles for his children, and he should, and he does, and he will. But uh, there should not be a craving in our hearts for miracles, thinking that'll bring revival. It, it doesn't bring revival. Rev miracles, uh, they, they do not bring revivals. Now, they'll bring a crowd. I want you to know that Pharaoh wasn't impressed in the least with the miracles Moses performed. Jezebel wasn't impressed in the least with the miracles that Elijah performed. And even Israel itself, when, when, John, when Elijah called down fire from heaven, uh, the people were still not impressed. Oh, they said, the Lord, he's God. But uh, Elijah got ran off and finally prayed and he said, God, I'm the only one left in Israel. He couldn't see any result. It didn't produce a revival in the least. That great miracle did not produce a revival in Israel. Now, <clears throat> I, I want to touch on a little something here. I think of the doctrine, for instance, in the church world, there is a doctrine of the rapture and a thousand years reign. Now, I... I'll be honest with you, I don't preach either one because I've never been brought up with it and I'm not here to say whether there is or isn't. Uh, and I'm not against it. I think it's a wonderful doctrine and you don't need to try and convince me of it. If there's going to be one, I'll be happy about it. So I'll say, Brother Morgan, I want to convince you. I don't, don't try to do that. I don't, that that's going to be one. That's wonderful. I'm for it. I think that'd be wonderful and I think it'd be wonderful to have a thousand years reign. But I just never was brought up with it. And uh, so I'm not trying to move in any way, 
Whether I believe it or not doesn't make any difference. If there's going to be one, there's going to be one. If there isn't, there isn't. So that's the way I look at it. And I'm not really worried about it. If there's going to be one, I expect to go up with them. But those who teach it teach that there's going to be uh, a rapture when the church will be taken out of the world and go up to meet with the Lord for seven years and then come back to the earth. If I, if I get it, if I'm straight and I'm not sure. Then they'll come back for se after seven years, they'll come back and then the Lord will set up a thousand years reign. Now, they say the Lord will take, in this rapture, the Lord will take every Christian out of the earth. If the President of the United States is a Christian, he'll be gone. If congressmen are Christian, they'll be gone. If husband, there's a husband that's saved and the wife isn't, well, the husband will be gone. Uh, now, I want you to know something. If that ever happens, you would think it would shake the world. But I want you to know it will not produce a revival. I want you to know that the world will not turn to God. And the Bible is very clear of it. If a president's gone, they'll only elect another one right away. If a congressman's gone, they'll elect others right away. If a man has lost his wife, he'll get another one. I want you to know this tremendous miracle that should shake the world will not produce a revival. It will not cause men to turn to God. If anything, it will unite the world against God and cause them to fight him all the more and hate him all the more. And I'm not sure where the doctrine of the Antichrist fits in, but maybe it fits in there. I don't know. The people unite against somebody that will fight against God and against Israel. So it will not produce a revival. It will take more than miracles to cause people to turn to God. And so, let's look at this a little bit. Elisha was going up to Bethel, the main means house of God, a city where God dwelt. But something happened to change this city from a God-worshipping city to a mocking city. How could it be? Well, let's look at this city just a little bit. This city was God's city. And when Solomon died, you remember, if you remember reading the story, this great king of Israel died. His son, uh, Rehoboam, uh, went to the elder men of the city and he said, should I, uh, uh, how, how should I govern these people? They said, the, the old men said, Be not, ease up on the people. Your father was hard on them. Ease up on the taxes and other things. And uh, then he went to the young men. They said, be harder on the people. And he took the young men's advice and he, and he became harder on the people than Solomon was. And so Jeroboam led a rebellion against uh, Rehoboam and uh, took 10 of the 12 tribes, took 10 of the 12 tribes and became known as the Northern Kingdom. All that Rehoboam had left was two kingdoms, was Judah and Benjamin. But Jeroboam had taken 10 of the 12 tribes, and that was the northern kingdom. Now here's where the problem came in. When he got those 12 tribes, those 10 tribes up there, I want to turn to 1 Kings and read what he did. 1 Kings, the 12th chapter. If you have your Bibles, you might want to look at it with me. 1 Kings 12, starting with uh, reading verse 28. He, Jeroboam now is ruling the ten tribes and in those ten tribes happens to be the city of Bethel and it was in the southern part of the ten tribes. So Jeroboam says in the 28th verse, whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel and the other in Dan, one in the south, one in the north. And this thing became a sin for the people. The people went to worship uh, even before Dan. I want you to notice what he did. He produced a religion of convenience. He said it's too far to go down to Jerusalem. You don't need to go that far. We'll just set up a golden calf here 
And they didn't think too much of that in those days because that was one of the gods of Egypt. And he said, well, set one up here in Bethel and you won't need to go all the way down. And that's too much. For, now, why trouble yourself? You don't want a religion that's going to trouble you. You want a religion of convenience. And it's convenient for you to go to Bethel. And this religion of convenience turned their hearts from a city that loved God with all of their hearts into a city that mocked him. What kind of a religion do we want? A, a religion of convenience? That's what caused the downfall of this city. We want a religion that makes it easy on us. Whatever it is, make it easy on us. We don't want God to demand things of us. I want to tell you, if God has his way, he'll make demands on you, that dear ones, that will hurt at times. But it'll cause you to praise God and shout the victory. Otherwise, a religion, they didn't leave off religion. They wanted a religion of convenience. Don't you know this interferes with our plans? I think sometimes <laughs> we've gone to waitings on God. Maybe we've had to stand for a long time. Maybe the thought comes to our mind, doesn't he know we're tired? You get up early in the morning, you start early in the morning, so doesn't he know we haven't had much sleep? What's the matter around here? A religion of convenience. We don't want to be inconvenient. And that's the thing that turned Bethel from the city that it was, the city of God, to mocking him. We're going to make it easy on you. Imagine. And the great decline in that city became because of this. So Jeroboam did. He set up a golden calf. So that do that very same thing. A convenient religion turned this great city into a mocking city. I remember hearing Dr. Bob Pierce preaching one time. He was very strict, hard, seemingly on young people. And he made that thing. He said, we, we lost, we lost, our, I heard him preach to a big crowd. He said, we lost our young people when we took the cross out. You have a religion that will give them everything they want. And I'm not against games and all this other, but you take the cross out, you've lost them with all of the games and everything else you can do for them. They'll not stick with you or Jesus or anything else. They'll be gone. He said, we lost our young people when we took the cross out. And I remember hearing him preach one time at one on the Youth for Christ, about 5,000 young people there. And he urged him to come to God. He said, come on down here and kneel in this sawdust. He said, if you have to get your suit dirty, get it dirty. I mean, he didn't waste words with them. But it's the kind, if any, came on those grounds. Those are the kinds that'll stick. The kind that stick or that don't stick. Uh, the kind where the cross has been taken out and you just simply want to give them everything they want. Let's, let's entertain these young. We've got a crowd of young people. All right, they'll, they'll leave God if you, don't take, if you take the cross out. I'll tell you ahead of time. I'm not against them having wonderful times and they should have wonderful times of fellowship, but you take the cross out, you've lost them. A convenient religion had turned the house of God a while. Hosea called it that the name from Bethel was changed. He changed it to Beth Avon, meaning a house of nothing, a house of vanity. Bethel, from the house of God to the house of vanity. The prophet Hosea said that of it. A convenient religion will turn the house of God into a house of vanity, or a house of nothing. It makes our religious a religion of convenience when, when we simply want it that way. No wonder they mocked Elijah and Elisha. No wonder that God permitted bears to come out and maul 42 of the children. See what had happened in this great city? No wonder God turned two bears loose on these young people to maul them and tear them and send them back home. This is a message from God. God is God. Oh, that we could fall before him and worship him as we ought to do. 
So Jesus came speaking in kindness. God always speaks in kindness, healing the sick, performing miracles, feeding the 5,000. But when they rejected him, he spoke of the destruction of Jerusalem. He said, you've turned your back on me, now there's going to be a destruction of Jerusalem. And as Paul said, behold the goodness and severity of God. God will deal with us in goodness first if he can. He always does. He loves us. But if he can't, then he'll deal in severity. So God would rather deal with us in kindness. So, dear ones, let's don't look for religion of convenience. Let's follow the cross and follow Jesus wherever he leads. And I'll tell you, then we can still keep our faith in God, and God will still do wonderful things for his children.